Okay, welcome to the September. This meeting is being recorded. 2024 version of the Atlanta Radio Club uh, monthly meeting. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We have a great uh, presentation uh, again, as always. Rob does a stupendous job of getting us a, a great speaker and uh, a great presentation. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, I think we'll skip. We wanna, do we want to do introductions inside the room or no? We'll skip. We'll skip the introductions tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, Real quick, uh, Stephen, uh, do you have any repeater uh, updates or anything like that you need to relate to anybody? Nope, not really. Okay, everything working. Yep. Okay. All right, well, if that's the case, thanks, Stephen. I'm going to turn it over to our dashingly handsome Rob Osat and KI4UTY and uh, let him take it away. So go ahead, Rob. I got him pulled again. <laughs> Hello, speaker. I got a good good speaker again this month. Um, and I don't know how I found him, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, and Dr. Mike Harper, um, WA9PIE. So he's from HRD Software, and he's going to tell you all about it. And I think you're going to, I'm going to find, expect to find things about it that I don't know, didn't know. So this should be good. So Mike, I'm turning it over to you. Good evening. Good evening. And, uh, I'm going to, while you guys are recording it, I'm I'm also going to attempt to record it. And I think, you know, if you guys post yours on Face or on uh, YouTube, I'll post this one on Face or YouTube. And uh, somehow between the two of us, we'll have something that's uh, that's viewable. I'm mm -hmm. going to, um, the, the challenge that I have is I've got a 49-inch curved monitor, and it's really a challenge for sharing on uh, things like this. But I've so if you'll bear with me, sometimes I have to flip the flip the thing around a little bit. So let me uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Sometimes it requires that you enable sharing, which I'm gonna need you to do, John, or whoever's got the, the okay, good. Yeah. Sir. Let's see. Good, 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 good. So I will share. See how to make this work out well. Mm, yeah, bear with me. Just want to make sure that you can see what I'm going to share when I share it. And then I'll have to reshare it here in a second. Okay. Can you see the screen at this point? Yes. You see the whole slide? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, I'm Mike Carper, and I'm with Hamrayo Deluxe or HRD Software. And uh, first thing is, I want to thank you for having me. I enjoy doing presentations, and they've become a lot more popular since COVID because uh, everyone has kind of figured it out <laughs> with regards to having online meetings and the like. So, um, so it's been a lot, I get to do it a lot more often. It makes it fun because I enjoy the dialogue. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ham Radio Deluxe, but I'm really, you know, interested in what you guys are interested in and what you guys would like to hear about. But I wanted to thank you. And uh, for those of you who are our customer, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then, you know, for those of you that aren't, uh, maybe we'll have an opportunity to, to convert you. I tell people there's really only two kinds of ham radio operators, the ones that use ham radio deluxe and the ones that don't use it yet. So, <laughs> um, you know, hopefully we'll get you, we'll get you on the, on the list. Does anyone recognize this logo? Um, you guys were talking earlier about, uh, uh, basically north of the, north of the loop, you know, at 285. And I used to have an office in perimeter center, um, not far from the train and um, not far from the mall up there. And then uh, I was, I was with GTE for about 10 years and um, primarily building cellular networks. So I did the RF engineering on the cellular networks in the early nineties when we were putting markets on the air for the first time. And um, then in about 1998, it turned into this 
And uh, you may or may not be familiar with a building that we built out on Windward Parkway. And um, so I heard you talking about a lot of familiar landmarks. So I just threw that stuff in there because uh, I used to have a, a house that I shared with a friend of mine in, um, in coming. And uh, this was back when uh, planes were attempting to land on Georgia 400. Uh, if you remember back that far. So and I don't think it was an intentional landing either, by the way. So anyway, um, I have an affinity for Atlanta. Um, in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about, for, for those that don't know much about Ham Radio Deluxe, I'm going to talk about what it is, how we sell it. I talk about how we sell it because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that and try to clear that up as much as I can. You know, who are we? You know, who are the people that are behind all of this? What are we working on? We'll do a little bit of a demo, um, probably work some FT8. Um, if I'm uh, if I'm able to do it, we'll do a little bit of a show and tell on the version that we're working about on now. And then we'll do some, I'll make some comments about kind of what the two to three year outlook is in version seven. So Ham Radio Deluxe is basically a suite of five applications. And um, you can say six, and I'm going to hit that point in a moment, but it's basically five applications. There's a rig control application. And unlike a lot of other rig control applications, except for just a few, um, our rig control application is meant to give you access to every on-air feature um, that the radio is capable of. So some will only do, some software will only do frequency mode, VFO. But um, here, the nice thing about it is, is that if you have a radio where the menu to get, if you want to get to the, I don't know, certain filters or certain kinds of things, you go three or four layers deep in a menu trying to find it. Here you can put it, you know, where you want it and you can access it as often as you need um, right from the PC. I think we have the best logbook or logging program available. And um it's really designed for DXers in mind, but it's good for other people, whether they're awards trackers, digital modes, fans, or, you know, even rag chewers or whatever. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things you can do with it here in a bit. Um, our digital mode software pretty much does everything that WSJTX doesn't do. And I'll talk about that as we get to a little bit of the demo, but basically DM780 does um, really... PSK 30, you know, PSK of all different varieties, uh, Olivia, MFSK, um, you know, both versions of RIDI, whether it's AFSK or FSK, lots of stuff there. Pretty cool. Uh, we have a rotor control program that you can uh, enables you to operate the rotor control within the logbook or from within our satellite tracking application, which controls the radio for Doppler shift in your um, antenna for azimuth and elevation. There's another application which is called Mapper that we really haven't put a lot of effort into, honestly, over the last few years. And um, that application will go away um, in, in favor of something else that I'll talk about a little bit further in the presentation. So how do we sell it? Well, a lot of people uh, will call me and they'll say, um, hey, I've got the version that you were selling 10 years ago. Well, the good news is we don't sell versions. Um, we sell perpetual software licenses. So if you buy the software, you have a perpetual software license that entitles you to activate any current or future version of the application. So you're not stuck on a version. In fact, we want you to be able to move to the newer versions because that's where we introduce new features or new, you know, enhancements and things of that nature. Um, but we do sell the features as we go along. I'll talk about that a, a little bit. Um, but we don't sell subscriptions. So we therefore we don't have subscribers. I, I people will call me or contact me occasionally and say, Hey, I've been a subscriber for a long time. Well, I appreciate your support, but we don't have subscribers because we don't we don't sell subscriptions. But let me be clear: we don't sell the software as a subscription. 
when you buy the software, you get 12 months of unlimited technical support, and you're entitled to all the features that we release over the course of the coming year. At the end of that period of time, if it does everything you want it to do and you don't need our support, and we never end up releasing a feature that you like, then just keep using it, keep downloading the next versions, and um, keep trucking along. Um, no need to give us any money. I'm going to try to figure out a way to help you part with your money. Um, because I'm going to try to introduce features like HRD alert that we'll talk about as we go through here. And as we um, uh, roll out new features, major features like that, um, they're enabled um, when your new features and support date is after the um, feature release date. So that's how we enable the features um, uh, over that 12 month period of time. There's a whole lot of stuff that we give away for free. Um, and so, you know, in terms of functionality, I'm going to show some of it here uh, in a bit when we do the demo. Um, bug fixes at no charge. Like I said, just keep downloading the new releases. If ever we want to, if ever we can convince you to buy a renewal of new features and support, it's always 50% of whatever the going price is. And frankly, we send out discounts on all that stuff quite often. So um, that's what we got there. And then uh, when I started this, um, so basically the software was created by a gentleman in Europe named Simon Brown. At the time his call was HB9DRV. I think he's changed it to G4ELI and he's moved back to Wales. And um, I ended up hearing somebody talk about it on a on a repeater in the Pittsburgh area when we were living there. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, whatever it was, the Shave Club. You know, I, I enjoyed it so much, I bought the company. <laughs> um, but I, I eventually decided um, that I would use it. And I started talking to Simon. And eventually Simon said, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't want to support this anymore. I'm not going to update it anymore. And this was in... 2010 I thought man this is it's got a lot of potential here it's not it's not done in my opinion so I tried to talk him into selling it to me and it took me about a year to talk him into it but I'm not a, de a software developer so I brought on uh, a partner and uh, he uh, suggested we bring on another partner so I started off with uh, two other partners um, one of them uh, left the company at the end of 2016. And then uh, Randy and I continued the business um, together from the first of 2017 up until I bought him out about uh, 2021, so about three years ago. And um, so at this point, it's kind of a family-owned business. Uh, Lindy is my oldest daughter. She's got an MBA from TCU, and she's a pretty smart cookie. And she does a lot of the sales and marketing. My wife, as uh, you might imagine, is in charge of all the money. <laughs> and um, and then we've got, uh, it says three tech support staff, but that's including me because I get in there occasionally and, and jump after it. But if it's not me, you'll end up with Kevin in Florida or Ferry in the Netherlands. Um, Ferry obviously is available a lot earlier and, and Kevin's available in midday. And if if it's a late night, later night thing, it's probably me because that gets me out of the way of my day job, which is, is not HRD. We've got anywhere from three to seven developers. I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. 18 beta testers pretty much from every corner of the, of the planet. And our goal is to be the indis most indispensable asset in your shack. Um, we want to make you more productive. We want to have highly satisfied customers. We want to do this is then now this is where it gets hard. We want to do four releases a year, uh, which is about 80 20 in terms of content. So 80% fixes and improvements, 20% enhancements. Uh, we'd like to do two to four new features a year and add a new application every 24 months. So that's those are the targets I've given the development team. And, and so there's a view of the target right now. <laughs> um, they're missing the target, um, but we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are and, and what we're doing to get it back on track. So uh, 
we've been working on a rewrite of logbook, which was initially intended for the sole purpose of eliminating Microsoft Access from the product. And um, so it turns out um, when you get into it, basically this code had been written for Microsoft XP. And so there's a lot of things that got brought along with that that, that were really causing additional problems um, if you're a developer and, and trying to keep the software fresh and new and keep it growing. And um, so as we had eliminated Microsoft Access in favor of SQLite, we were finding a lot of other things that needed to go. And in the process, we decided we were going to just completely write the rewrite the application. So that's probably at the 85% stage right now. I'll show you what we've got done here in a few minutes. Um, but that's um, the the end result is, you know, I think I got some of this stuff here and I'll hit, so I want to get ahead of myself. But once the rewrite is done, then we'll do quarterly rewrites on logbook while we're working on the rig control uh, rewrite. And once that's done, we'll do quarterly updates on logbook and rig control while we're working on DM780 and so on. And then um, there's a couple new applications that we're working on. Um, let me see if I hit this in an upcoming slide here in a second. Um, I mentioned the rewrite, but it also will enable the application to run natively as a 64-bit application on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, we want it to be easier to use. We've had lots of developers over the year who didn't really understand the software. So every time they added an option, they added it in a different place. So there's a lot of a lot of redundant and confusing places to go in order to get things uh, properly configured. And a lot of the things that should be configured out of the box were set to disabled. And so you actually have to go hunting for that stuff and enable it. Um, not too bad. Um, if you go to it, frankly, you know, go to our YouTube page and there's a YouTube video there where I go through all the initial setup and it probably takes 10 minutes, but if you're, if you don't know where to go, um, that that's a good resource to, to get you there. Um, one of the things that's been a pain point is when new radios are added, you actually have to have a developer add the radio in code. And so with the 610 rewrite, we were, all, we're already starting on this, but with the 610 rewrite, we'll be able to build the radio as an XML file. You'll be able to upload the radio, uh, the, the configuration, and without doing a software release, without requiring a, a developer, we'll be able to actually just um, send out the updates for the radios and get radios out pretty much you know, whenever the commands and configurations are available, um, probably before they're publicly available as a radio. Um, should be multilingual. HRD Global View um, is an application that will replace um, Mapper. So Mapper today gives you the ability to display your QSOs on a map. Sometimes it's, you know, if you've been doing it for 50 years like I have and, and a lot of you may have been doing, um, if you put all your QSOs in there, you just got a big screen of, you know, that's a blob, right? So sometimes I put my six meter QSOs on there just so I can, you know, see something that's interesting, but, um, and it works, it's fine, but HRD Global View will be, um, it'll be a combination of what Mapper can do today, as well as um, the things that Grid Tracker can do today if you're using Grid Tracker as well as uh, things like what you would see in the um, ham radio bundle from um, Geochron, um, there's a you know ham clock, all that kind of stuff in one application that'll be included with the, the suite. And then uh, you'll be able to cast that over your network to a, um, a monitor on your network. So if you want to cast it to a 4K monitor on your network, comes with our software, all the configurations from all the rest of the radio. So you can show, you know, if you want to see DX spots or propagation or your last 15 QSOs with cute little lines that, you know, draw to between your QTH and where you worked, um, that's what that'll be doing. Um, we've got a partnership with a company that um, 
already makes ham radio uh, contesting software. And we'll be working to integrate that into our suite. So um, a lot of people have said, hey, man, you can't, uh, this this contesting stuff is hard, man. You can't, uh, you can't maintain that. And the good news is we won't have to, because if we do it the way I think we're going to do it, um, we'll, you know, someone else will maintain it. We'll end up, we'll end up selling it as a, um, as a, as an add-on product because we'll pay royalties for it, but it'll be a real honest to goodness contesting program. HRD programmer will be an application um, similar to what you might get from RT systems or um, chirp. Um, it'll be an application that will enable you to program the memories and certain configurations in your radio. So that'd be good. We've already started on that. Uh, not quite ready to release it because we're focused on rig on a logbook. Uh, we've got out of these six or so developers, we're putting about 12,000 hours of development into this a year. It's a big investment. Um, my wife tells me it's a big investment. We watch the money going out of the bank account quite often. And, um, but if you, if you figured out what your favorite hourly rate is times the number of hours, it's not an insignificant amount of investment that we're putting into this. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not a software developer, so I have to get someone who actually knows what they're doing to do it. And um, But we do have a, a, a strong commitment to the future of the software, and it's important um, to keep it fresh and keep it um, modern. And that's what our goal is. Uh, the new applications, when we get to version 7, um, are going to look like this. This is real code, so this is... Um, already some of the mock-ups that have been done for version seven. This is what you would see in uh, DM780. So much like a lot of what you would see with other Windows application, there's a ribbon um, where you get to everything in, in kind of uh, groups. Um, the radios will look, uh, if you want, the radios will look like your radio. Uh, this is real code, so this is, um, but it's a screenshot. This is the IC9700. You can see in the tab over there, there's also an FTDX10, or sorry, FTDX101. And so the intention is, if you want the screen to look like your radio, you'll be able to get the screen to look like your radio. Uh, I would caution though, that if when, when your screen looks like the radio, getting to things in the menu is just as difficult as if you had your hands on the radio. Okay. So um, you can do it. I'm, I prefer, I'm going to prefer to use the existing kind of old style screen, which kind of allows me to put all the things that I want to see on the screen. So they're readily available. So you have a choice between what, you know, how you want to do that, but there'll be a, um, a ribbon at the top, kind of like I mentioned a while ago and so on. Um, this is a view of HRD programmer, pretty familiar UI. If you've used something like RT systems or chirp, um, basically, it look, looks like a spreadsheet. Um, you either obtain a CSV of the of the frequencies or repeaters you want to program, and you know away you go. That's how that works. Uh, so, well, think, well, was there a question? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. to DMR. DMR. Say that again. Well, that's well, that's 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 your phone, phone, phone. Turn, no. the, turn the mic on. Where is it? Feel like I'm in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if you, I can come back to the question if you if you want. And I'm definitely going to do Q and A here here at the end, but uh, which I think is the best part of the whole deal. Um, I want to talk about um. HRD alert and the DX cluster, but I, I first want to explain what you're going to look at. So for all the DXers in the audience, um, when we use visual, we use visual indicators um, in HRD. And so uh, I didn't want to just rely on colors because some people have color blindness issues. So their colors and their symbols, um, mm -hmm. but I'll refer to them by their color. Um, if uh, if you see something that's red, 
it means you've not worked it. And when I say it, it could be a country, a DXCC country, it could be a state, county, grid, zone, iota, whatever. I mean, if uh, if you see it and it's red, and I'll show you some examples, then it means you've not you've not worked it on that particular band or mode. And then um, if you've worked it but you've not confirmed it, it'll be yellow. And then if you've worked it and confirmed it, it'll be green. So the 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 feature in HRD alert uh, or the feature of HRD alert was intended to take decodes out of your FT8 program, WSJTX or JTDX, and display them on the screen, showing you whether or not you need the country, zone, state, provinces, counties, and all the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, this provides you with visual alerts, audible alerts, and if you want, you can have it send a text message to your phone, I found this quite useful, by the way, because there have been days where I've been in the office in my day job and um, something pops up that says, you know, this new country that I needed for a new band country is on the air. And, you know, I find a good excuse to go have a lunch in my mobile and um, work them, add them to the log. But um, there'll be other visual indicators and things of that nature you can um, you can filter it pretty much however you want so you can get the kind of information you need. Since we put this in, just for my results, by the way, because we, we put this together in early 2022. And um, as I started testing it, I went from about 2,000 uh, DXCC band countries, or I call them challenge points, to 2,400, so I gained about 400 in about 12 months, which when you get above 2,000, it gets <laughs> it gets uh, a lot harder. And, and now I'm at 2,610. And it's all by way of, yes, I'm working FT8, but I'm also getting this information that shows me what I need. Um, I've also won the fifth call area certificate for CQ Marathon, CQDX Marathon, the last two years, I'm, I'm expecting to win it again this year. Um, but the majority of my QSOs have been uh, made using uh, WSJTX with FT8 primarily, but um, I'll go to whatever band or mode I need to go to to, uh, to get a new one in the log. With that, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And uh, if anybody had any questions, I'm going to kind of wire up a demo here and get that going. So give me one moment. Did my screen sharing go away? Uh, no. Okay, hang on. Uh, I'm going to, hang on a second here. Give me one second. This is like I said, this is kind of the challenge with um, having to shuffle the screen around on a 49 inch monitor it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time so i'm going to share my screen i'm going to share this hopefully now you're looking at logbook yes. and uh let me start up my recording again I'm getting echo. It was me, I'm muted. Okay. Okay. So this is um this is logbook and right now I have um, HRD alert displayed. That's what this thing is down here in the bottom half of the screen. I'll bring over um, I'll bring over WSJTX just for a moment so you can see that you know when when WSJTX displays the decodes, they immediately go into HRD alert. 
as we'll see right now. And then HRD oh. alert will go through your log in 500 milliseconds or less for 100% of all these decodes and find out whether or not you need it for a new country, a new grid, a new county, mm -hmm. um, state, zones, and so on. I don't have everything displayed here. Some people will say, well, you know, that's pretty busy. Yeah, it's it's busy. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. But if you if you only care about DXCC, for example, you can just go and change the layout. You can remove or add whatever columns you want or don't want and kind of pare it down so it, it's not so much stuff on the screen. But uh, once you get used to it and you, you, you realize that I'm really looking for the red things here, um, it makes it a whole lot easier. Um, my, just to give you an idea, I mean, in my log, this is my DXCC. Um, I've worked 2,610 countries and I've confirmed 2,560 of them. I need uh, 50, you know, confirmations here to, you know, close the gap on that. But because the majority of my QSOs are confirmed, that's why under here where you see the, the country band and mode, there's a lot of green there because um, I've confirmed everything that I've worked primarily. But if I want to, you know, just basically say, well, only show me stuff if I need it. Well, when I click that, it, it doesn't show me anything because I don't, I don't need that country. But let's say, for example, I want to go and um, maybe I'm interested in um, also interested in states, let's say. So um, now once I hit the filter, it will show me only those decodes that are for a country that I need or a state that I need on a particular band. So under the B column here where it says band and state, um, I need to work some of those. Uh, the ones that are yellow yellow triangles or yellow indicators mean I, means I've worked Mississippi on 15 meters before, but I've never confirmed it, which is odd. Um, when I click on it, it does the look up over here and shows me that Malcolm is in Vicksburg, Mississippi. I can see, you know, what I've worked with him before up here. There's nothing here. I'll show you an example of where I've worked somebody. Because if there's uh, over here like this B4 button, uh, I can see that I've worked him B4 on this band and mode. So that'll show up there. And um, so I know that I don't need to work him again on that band or mode. I might, I might want to do that if it's a different band or mode. Um, if I go and double click this one, like I just did, I'm going to drag WSJTX over here and we can see that it's already starting to transmit because all I did was double click on the, on the row that I wanted to work. I'm going to drag this out of the way. Essentially, I don't even need to have WSJTX in front of me. All I need to have is this. Um, so it's going to transmit and we'll see here in a minute if, uh, he didn't answer, so I'm going to go and call somebody else here and see if that works out. So that's that's what's going on there. And um, let me just real quickly make sure that, yeah, I'm transmitting, so that's good. Um, same thing about the DX cluster. And you can see I've pared down the DX cluster. I don't have as much as many columns shown here. If I hit the filter and turn that filter on, I can see some, I want to... Um, I'm not so interested in the states over here, so I'm going to make sure that's flipped off. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so now if I if I turn the filter on again, it's going to show me if any of the any of the DX spots are for countries that I need on a particular band. Um, it'll show that to me. I, if I'm interested in mode, I could show that as well, but um, that's not what I'm what I'm looking for at the moment. Now you can see that um, if I scroll down here, he's called me back. So that's why that one is, is red. Um, if I want to change this and say, well, just only show the ones calling me. So I'm now answering him back. And if things go well, we'll put him in the log. So 
the licensing requirements that are in place for WSJTX and, and those modes don't allow us to add, there's the 73. And now I got the pop-up that says, do you want to put it in the log? I'm going to click on OK. When I do, you're going to see it pop up at the top of the log. It'll do a QRZ lookup at the same time and put all the information right there. And that was really fast. So um, so that's how that works. And I go back to show all of them. Sometimes I want to see CQ or me. So show me the anybody calling CQ or anybody calling me. And um, and that's how we get to that. So I could I could call somebody again here, but I want to focus on you guys. But that's that's what that feature is, and it's really accelerated the pace of getting um, new countries into my log. That's for sure, and it's been um, it's been a lot of fun. So um, let's see here. Let, let me let me show you a little bit about how this looks in uh, version. Six nine. Well, here's somebody calling me, so I'm gonna. I'll at least answer him back. <laughs> see if that works out. I'm trying to move some things around my screen here so I can see you guys okay. So, Mike, we can't see your cursor. So when you say this and that, we don't okay. see what you're pointing at. Okay, I'll try to be mindful of that. Um, It's too bad I can't make the cur the cursor something strange or different. So right here, this red row, um, he just answered me and gave me 73s. So uh, at this point, I can log it. I didn't get the signal report in there for some reason, but that's I'll, I'll gather that up later. So this whole lower portion that's green and red, that's HRD alert. And that's where you can see people calling me or um, calling each other, calling CQ. I'm gonna drop this down and show all the decodes. And along the way, um, you can see, you know, basically whether or not, like I said, you need that particular station. It's all figured out within the log. Let me see if I can uh, pull up the, um, Give me a second. I'm going to have to leave the screen. I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm going to pull this up. Let's see. At this point, I have no idea what you're looking at. <laughs> but give me a second. Um, right. So hopefully now you'll see a different version of logbook. I'm going to minimize this one. Okay. So what we've got here is a completely different version of Logbook. And one of the things that we did with this version of Logbook is um, it's a lot faster. For example, I want to restart uh, the DX cluster and the thing lights up really, really quick. Um, when we see uh, down here in the bottom screen, we're looking at DX cluster. If I click on a particular call sign, It'll do the lookup in QRZ, and now we're seeing the information I, I was... I, I think we're seeing your previous screen, mm. the one you were showing us before. Maybe Describe it. Describe oh. it for me so I know what you're looking at. But HRD alert as the lower box with two green lines on it. Uh, okay. Thanks for pointing that out. One second. Let's see. I'm, how do I unshare? Let's see here. I'm going to, I know. Yeah, that, I'm glad you said that. Let's try this. Is that good? Different? Yeah. Yes, that one's, that okay, one's perfect. a lot better. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> um, I'd rather share my whole screen, but if I did that, none of you would see it because 49 inches is going to squeeze into a, whatever you're looking at and it's not good. Um, anyway, what I was getting at is that down here with the DX cluster, if I click on a call sign, it'll bring it back in a table versus the mess that it was before where you couldn't really see, uh, you could, really couldn't see the things you were looking at. Um, if there's an image on QRZ, so for example, if I put in W1AW and, and it searches, eh, hang on, let me restart this. Again, we're working with um, the developer's test 
bed here. Hmm. Come on now. This is a this is a machine that's shared by several developers and me right now to to uh, test out the the work that they're doing. Let's see here. I may have to close it and restart it. Let's do that. That's always the challenge with doing live demos. Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go back. I'm going to go back over to, let me, I'm going to kill this off and then I'll come back to it in a minute. And let's go back to uh, my local version of logbook here. The idea here, though, is, is that um, whenever you click on a on a station, either in DX uh, cluster or HRD alert, it'll come over and it'll do the look up here. It'll it should put the uh, QRZ picture at the top. It'll put uh, the, the information, like I said a while ago. The, if you look at this information that's here, that I'm waving the cursor around. All this stuff is correct information, but I find it somewhat hard to read because I'm used to looking at a leaderboard table. So um, that's why you know we made it. We made a change to do something different there. Um, um, while you're while you're looking at that, I'm gonna come back around to the other one and see if I can get that one to behave. We'll come back and see how that's going. So let me let me stop here for a moment and just uh, ask if there are any questions about anything you've seen or anything I've said so far. When will 7.0 be released? Well, 7.0 won't be released until probably 2026. Because, so, uh, what's that? So if you bought version 6.9, you would need to... Pay fifty extra dollars to get the seven zero version. No, no, it's just that we, in order to get, in order to get to seven zero, we have to rewrite five applications. Okay. So right now we're rewriting logbook, and uh, when that's done, that'll be version six nine. That'll be a pretty significant upgrade. Um, a pretty significant. Uh, there's a lot of features in that that I want to show you that we're basically giving away for free that'll be in that version. And then 610, let me go back and see if I can get to the presentation that where I had that particular slide here, because it probably describes it a lot better. Let me do this. So here, uh, 69, as you can see on this top line that uh, we're working on now, when that's done, We'll release 6.9 and then we'll do quarterly updates to version 6.9 while we're recoding rig control. And when we recode rig control, that'll come out as version 6.10. And then we'll do quarterly, quarterly updates for rig control and logbook while we're working on the DM780 rewrite, which is version 6.11. Um, then on to rotor control, which will be 6.12. Then on to satellite tracking, which will be 6. 13, then we'll be adding um, a few of these other uh, applications. We'll be ready to release the Mac Linux version. So when version seven is out, it'll be the culmination of all these all these things. So we'll there, there will be between now and version seven, there'll be at least five different major releases. Does that help? 
Yes. Um, if you're, if you're, um, I know the contest edition is version seven. Uh, if we wanted to contest now, is, is, is there a way to do it with this software? I know that, well, what is it that we use now? M MPJ? Yeah. Oh, no, shoot. What is the name? Yeah, you know, much like much like you saw when when I added these FT8 QSOs a while ago, much like with the way you saw it happen there, you can use N1MM, you can use N3FJP, you can use uh, when what is it? When uh, write log, I think it is, or you know, there's there's a there's several of them there that basically. You just work right within your contesting program, like N1MM, for example. And as you make QSOs in N1MM, it'll automatically populate them into the logbook. So there's nothing that you, when the contest is over, as far as your log's concerned, there's nothing you need to do because all those QSOs will already be in your log. So you don't have to export them from N1MM or you know FJP or whatever it is. They automatically already end up in your log. Okay. And there's um yeah. there's information on our on our website or a support site about how to how to connect up you know N1MM and FJP and and the like. I'm going to call uh, another station here. Other question? I got a question in four parts. No. Um yeah. my first one was the radio programmer. Um <clears throat> uh, will that do DMR? Yeah, it should, ideas. yeah, it should, it should. And you could take the input from a CSV file. That'd be nice. Yeah, yep, yep. That's that's what the intention is. You know, it should you work know. just. It should work just pretty much like you're you you're used to seeing with Chirp or um, RT systems, or you know, if you're using the Kenwood programmer or whatever. Um, or the the uh, Yesu one, similar kind of concept there. Well, hopefully you're different because the those to me they are a pain in the neck. If you have <laughs> well, the way they do it is if you have four talk groups or six talk groups, you just got to enter that line over and over and over again for the same the same repeater. And if you could shortcut that, that'd be nice. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're we're happy to take feedback when we get to that stage for sure. Okay, I apologize for asking dumb questions, but I'm kind of new to this. Uh, if I was doing POTA at a park and I'm making contacts, how would I enter my contacts in the software? And then how would I download it to the POTA site? Yeah, so this is hopefully, do you see a shark on the screen right now? Yes. yes. Okay. So <laughs> this is version six nine, and I'm going to show you kind of to answer your question. We've added support for Poda and Soda and worldwide flora and fauna into the next release. So, for example, if your call was and I didn't catch who asked the question, but I'm just going to randomly pick somebody off the screen here, K four V E R, and um, we can see, you know the location that comes up, but let's say for whatever reason, John is at a POTA site and I can come over here on the POTA tab. And if I put, I can start typing, I could type in the, um, I could type in the POTA. I could type in, I don't know, I'm just going to put in, give, give me a POTA, is Rainier a POTA site? At the lake or something? Um, uh, the Don Carter State Park. Okay. Or Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain. Here's, here's Don Carter, the one at the top. So basically, you can search for it by name, and then it'll fill in all the rest of the stuff for you. So if you if you didn't know what the POTA reference number is, but you knew it was Don Carter State Park, you just pick it out of the list, and it puts in um, the uh, POTA reference number, uh, the state, the lot, lat long, and the grid. I mean... Some of these parks are really large, right? I mean, if you were in um, Glacier National Park or Yosemite, that, that those things span several grids. So 
you know, you want to make sure that the grid is correct, you know, when you work the guy, but basically once you're done and you put it in the log, you know, so I just added it, but let's make sure I click the, there it goes. Um, but once you get it in the log, then you're just going to select those and you'll uh, either export them to get them up to the POTA site or um, if they give us um, a direct, more direct way to get there, then you'll be able to do that. But right now, you would just export them and put them into, uh, you put them into an ADIF, and that's how you get it there. So then you can see, you know, that that QSO is at the top. I'm trying to wave my cursor around. You can see it's at the top. This list over here, down here at the bottom, where the uh, DX cluster is. Again, if I if I go and click on a different call sign. Um, I get the lookup information. This is what I was talking about a while ago, where now I see it in a tabular format. Um, here's here's one that I've worked before. So I should see, I've got his uh, QRZ image up here. And for that particular station, I can see that I've worked him and confirmed him on digital on 80, 40, 30, 20, and 17. And I can go down here. I can see what his name and address is. I got his email address and all that stuff. If I come down further, I can see on Canada, I can see that, um, you know, I've worked, for example, on phone, I've worked Canada on 160 meters phone, but I've never confirmed it. I've also worked Canada on 12 meters digital and never confirmed it. I've never, apparently never worked uh, 17, worked them on 17 meters phone. So that's what all this stuff over here is is meant to tell you without having to go through a bunch of other, um, you know, there's other ways to get it in the current software, but it's a little bit more of a challenge to get it. You have to go to a couple different screens. So for the photo site, you have to um, create a file and export it to them. What about QRZ or Logbook of the World? Yeah, QRZ. so QRZ and Logbook of the World, or if I wanted to upload, you know, let's say, these QSOs, I just highlight them and click on the upload button to get them to Logbook of the World. Uh, right now, it's not automatic, but we'll, we'll get to that point. Um, underneath the, when you want to configure um, your uploads for Club Log, for example, you configure that here. In the new version, they're all on one screen. Basically, you can set up Club Log and EQSL and Ham Log and QRZ and Logbook of the World. So you, you set them all up. And if you have multiple call signs, that's why I've got these other things up here because I've got an Australian call sign. So I have to put that into um, QRZ.com with a different profile or EQSL with a different profile. So you can set them up separately. But once you get your username and password in here, then whenever you... Um, make a new QSO, it automatically goes up to one of those services with the exception of, of logbook of the world. And then you can, you can just select them and send them up. But then, then the downloads basically do the same thing uh, in reverse for this. I mean, QRZ doesn't have a download, but uh, nor does club log, but logbook of the world and EQSL do. So you can download. Um, if I click the download button over here for logbook of the world, it would, asked to download my, I'm not going to do it on this machine, but, or I could download my uh, EQSL stuff doing it the same, pretty much the same way. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Who asked the question, by the way? What's your call? KO4SRJ. Again? KO4SRJ. Kilo Oscar 4, Sierra, Romeo, Juliet. And your Ed? Yes. All right. So this is, you can see that I got, here's Ed's information. Apparently you don't have an image on your QRZ site. That's what I was looking oh. for. The other cool okay. thing that you can do, I'm not going to do it on here, but um, if if I had Google Earth installed in this particular machine, I could click on the latitude and longitude. And it would actually take me to Ed's house from Google Earth. So I could you know, check out Ed's antennas and <laughs> see, what, see what kind of car he drives. And I, I live in a con, you wouldn't see too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, over here on the right-hand side is um, uh, we're improving the view of, and I can't 
just by virtue of the way this is set up on this cloud-based PC, it's a virtual machine, but I can't pull the fader over. But now you can you start to see the uh, work status indicators here. The comments are going to be up there, which is a whole lot better than what it used to be. So you'll get rich information from there as well. Um, so that's that's some of the stuff that I did mention. Uh, let let me let me show you one other thing because if I if I open up one of these um, Palmyra QSOs, you know it's going to bring up their QRZ image, and if I go over here to the work tab, I can see all the bands and modes that I've worked um, in 5J. But if I'm if I'm in a pileup or if I see them spotted, I don't want to have to go and open a QSO just to see this information. So that's why, as I was saying a while ago, it's over here in a table. So I can see just on this one table, I've worked N5J on 30 meters CW, 20 meters phone, 12 meters CW, and 10 meter digital. And frankly, that's all I had to work them on because I already had them on all the other bands. So if I go down to the bottom of this, you can see that, um, Oh, that's not where I wanted to be. I need to update their country listing, and that's why. Can you say um, that again? No, Siri, I cannot say that again. <laughs> I'm not sure what went wrong. <laughs> uh, you ever have that happen? Um, anyway, but uh, that's that's why you know the the table there is a whole lot better, and then having to go into the QSO and find it. Here's another guy that I've, I've worked him many, many times. So if I come down here, um, mostly on 12 meters, it turns out, but in this table, you can see the IOTA as well. So here's what I've worked and confirmed for IOTA for AF14. I mean, we could do, you know, you could, you know, eventually we could add POTA tables there or, you know, zone tables. We've got a lot of capability to uh, improve the the usability of that over time. Um, let me, any other questions about logbook as it stands right here? I wanna show a couple other quick things. I don't know if it's about logbook, but you have a lot of screens open here. Can you open like another tab? If you have like dual screens or like you have a large screen, can you take a tab and scroll over, pull it over to the side so you- Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you saw my whole screen right now, I mean, it's, it's 49 inches of stuff scattered from one side to the other. I mean, I've got uh, HRD log or HRD rig control here. I've got WSJTX here. I've got a uh, log book here. I've got other things that are kind of out of the way, but yeah, you can, there's with the five applications, you can put them anywhere you want, mm -hmm. just like you could if it was word and Excel and whatever. You can also, um, you can pop out some of these, um, if you wanted to pop out like the DX cluster or HRD alert, you can pop it out and move it someplace. And if it, if you get it to the point where you think it's all messed up and you don't like it the way it was, you just come back over to the default layout and it kind of puts you all back at the starting point so you can do it again. You get this software on a per uh, computer basis, or if say you're you're doing uh, work at home or work in the field, you need it on a laptop versus a home computer. Yeah, good question. So when you buy the software, you're entitled to run it simultaneously or have it simultaneously activated or running on five computers at the same time. Sometimes people will install it on a computer and then they decide, well, that the hard drive crashed or I threw the computer away, or I reloaded Windows. And uh, when there's not a deactivation event, it'll stay in your key, your activation key profile, but you can go back in later and just decide to take them out. There's an online portal where you can decide to take them out, but you, can, you have the ability to manage your five activations. Okay. Is there any impact on the user when Windows upgrades to a different level? Well, that's been part of the problem, frankly. Um, 
with access because uh, sometimes when Windows does an update, particularly when Microsoft Office does an update and your application is running um, uh, in, in, you know, access, then it can cause problems and we've had that happen. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're moving away from access. But generally speaking, I, I will say that with my computers, I always, I just set the Microsoft updates to automatic. They, they update when they want to update and it happens in the middle of the night when I'm not paying attention and I come back the next morning and it's done. I never, ever have any problems. So is this Windows only? It is at the moment, but uh, one of the outcomes of the work that we're doing is to um, make it uh, compatible with Mac and Linux. So, so that's that's one of the outcomes. Um, would that is, be the Apple Silicon? Sorry? Uh, um, no, I think it'll run on the... Um, I can't tell you what what the ARM processor or whatever it is. That's yeah. not my area of expertise, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it'll it'll run on um, you know anything that's capable running Mac and Linux when we get it to that point. Now this is I've got the um, rotor control application up right now, by the way, and. If you've got a you know a beam you want to point it at Europe, you just bring it around here and double click, and that will turn the rotor. Uh, I'm using a demo rotor right now, but that'll turn the rotor to uh, to Europe. I'm still seeing the logging screen. Rats! Ooh. I went and changed that multiple times. I now I know what we're doing here. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. That's so um, uh, if I wanted to, if I want to work some of my buddies in Australia, I just bring the cursor over here, point it at Australia, double click, and it won't work that fast with a real rotor unless we want to twist the antenna off of it. But um, it'll turn the rotor around to, to uh, 258. You can drop down whatever country. So, for example, if you want to point to the Cayman Islands, you can grab this and it'll flip it around. Um, that didn't go well. Let's see here. There we go. So then you you change the country and then hit the arrow and it'll put you over here. If I want to go to, let's say, for example, well, I don't know, Denmark, click that and hit the button. It'll move the antenna over to, to Europe. So then within logbook, now I'm going to try to flip back over to logbook. Hopefully that's what you're seeing now. Here in um, in logbook in the lower right, I connected to the rotor through the rotor program. Now, if I want to work a uh, station, let's say, for example, I'm going to put in my VK station uh, call sign here, VK4EIE. And we can see that that's the opposite direction. So right now I'm, I'm pointing basically 35 degrees. If I hit this rotor button right here, this one right here, it's gonna turn the rotor to uh, point to the station I'm gonna call. And you can see over in the lower right that the indicator is now pointing kind of west, southwest towards Australia. And then um, when you log it, the uh, azimuth and all that stuff, you can have that automatically populate into the QSO if you wanna do that. I'm not going to put myself in my own log. Um, let me show you one other thing for those of you that are using the satellite applications. We've also we've got a really good video on our uh, YouTube the channel. Yeah, the moon is visible. That's good news. I'm going to make sure that I'm actually showing you guys the um, the right application here, and. Um, you basically would select whatever, you know, you want to, I'm going to select the ISS just for fun. But you can see the passes down here. Um, I can connect to the rotor in the same way. And then I can cause the rotor to follow the antenna as it 
passes over the horizon and um, makes working satellites pretty easy. Oh. Which, which uh, I, I managed to do a bit of when I was in Australia. It's a lot of fun, especially when you're the especially when you're the DX. Mm -hmm. Well, it did the Doppler through the brake control. Yeah, yeah. So basically, when you launch that uh, satellite application, it's it connects to the sat it connects to the radio through the rig control application and basically it's sending it um retuning commands as the satellite moves i got a question about call the price or the what's the difference between the uh releases and the features um tell me again the difference between releases and features because you said if you oh yeah, yeah. so Every release, obviously, I'm going to say something that might be, you know, kind of redundant, but every release has content in it. About 80% of the content is bug fixes. 20% of it is feature enhancements or enhan minor enhancements. Uh, an example of a minor enhancement might be, um, for example, in the other version of, of Logbook that I was showing a while ago, you can click on something and it'll put the picture up here from QRZ. That's an enhancement. That's not a new feature. So when you do, when you um, when you download that particular release, you get the images from QRZ. Just to use that as an example, because that's a that's an enhancement. Uh, a new feature is something like HRD alert. So this tab here um, that I'm showing here, that's got all this decode activity in it right now. This is all th this. If I didn't have this feature enabled for myself, then I wouldn't have access to it. So when I tried to launch it, it would literally tell me that um, I'm not entitled to that particular feature. So if you went onto, onto our release notes page, it'll tell you what things are features and what things are, are um, enhancements. Also within the application, if I clicked on license key manager here, and when it brings this up, I can view the features that are enabled or not enabled for me, and it'll tell me what they are. But let me see if I can, I'm going to pull up um, our uh, release notes page, which I rarely ever do. And I'm going to make sure I'm sharing my screen with the proper application here. One second. And this one. Okay. So if you go to release notes.hamradiodeluxe.com, you'll get pages and pages and pages and pages. I mean, there's literally thousands of changes, improvements to the software going back to, let me see where the last one is, going back to this is 2012. So this is, Probably this was from the first release that we built after we acquired it from Simon. And you can see all the, the items there. Um, and if we clicked on it, um, it would take us to that record. There's not a lot in a lot of information, some of these older records, but for example, going back to this one, I'm going to click on, um, let's see, here's an enhancement and I'm going to click on that one. And I can see all of the information there. A lot of this, if I happen to be the one that wrote this up. So my notes are in here. And uh, if I scroll down, I'll see the images that I created for the developer. And then the, there might be some conversation between me and the developer or me and the beta testers as we built that particular feature out. This is in the 6.9 release. So if I go back over to the change log, all the items that are green here are items that are already done in 6.9. And, um, you know, here's the soda one, by the way. So, or but the POTA one for that matter. So if I click on this one, I probably wrote, I was the one that wrote this up. I'm describing what needs to be done. I'm telling the developers where they can get the park lists. Um, 
Uh, later on, I'm I'm drawing it up for them. So I, I mock it up so that they know what to do. There's some conversations back and forth with me and the developer. Um, we're building out the screens here, having a conversation about how this goes, you know, change from name to park name. You know, that's an example where this field previously said name. And if it said name, there's always a chance that somebody put John in the field and it's supposed to be the park name. So some of these kinds of back and forth, and here you can see that they changed it. Um, here's, here's where we're getting the um, ADIF fields correct. And so once that stuff is all built and it's done, then they'll put it in a release or a, a build and I'll go into their build machine, I'll test it. And if it's done, then I'll mark it green and then we'll go on to the next one. So for all of these things here, there are already 49 items that are a mix of, you can see bugs, enhancements, routine maintenance. But if I go back to the last release, we're basically a couple of things in it. But if I go back far enough, you know, there's some pretty major things in some of these releases in the past. And if you wanted to read about what they happen to be, um, you, know, you can click through the information and we don't, we don't hide it. A lot of the support folks would ask me, man, do, are you sure you really want to, you know, share this information with the world? And I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't we? I mean, in some cases, um, you know, some of our customers are requesting these changes. So, you know, we're, we're going to make sure that people can see what the status of the changes are. And that's kind of how you get um, a really transparent view of what's going on. So hopefully that's helpful. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions? What do you have for importing from other programs? Yep. So everybody, you know, pretty much saves their data or all the all the logging programs save their data as an ADIF file, but there's a few different formats and you can choose them here. But usually you'll select this uh, ADIF import. You'll come over here. You've got some options for how you want to how you want to treat this as it comes in. So if you want to update the um, DXCC information on import, do that. If you want to update the your station information on the QSOs when you let's say for example, if you there's a there's a fairly popular uh, POTA application that people take out to the field. It doesn't do any population of you know ADIF fields. So when you import it, you want to associate your station location or whatever your information is that you had for that particular location that's what does it now if i go back over to the um just to show you how this is changing in um, the new version here i'm back to the new version of logbook if i go into the import screen over here there's some uh, new ways to treat this so for example i can decide which and i don't in this particular case, I've only got one logbook loaded here, but if I had multiple logbooks loaded here, I could, I'd have a drop down that showed me which log I want to do, uh, um, which log I want to import it into. I can select, you know, which station location I want to assign to that particular, those uh, QSOs. So when this, when this comes out, when 6.9 comes out, there'll be a, I always do release notes and um, videos showing people what changed and, you know, they'll be on our YouTube channel so you can go and kind of follow along and stop the video, pause the video, you know, rewind the video. And um, we always put it in our support site too, by the way, which let me, um, let me plug the support site here real quick, just so that you guys know where to go if you need information. Once, once you are a customer, say for example, um, you want to know uh, if the question was just asked, how do I import 
um, QSOs into the log. If I go to support.hamradiodeluxe.com and just type in importing or import, it'll give you a choice of a whole bunch of things. And the top one happens to be the right answer. So you go here and you'll get um, all the instructions that I just was kind of briefly going over a moment ago. Um, if you want to find out uh, how do I use this with WSJT, and then I put in WSJT and it says, how do you use Ham Radio Deluxe with WSJT? And I click on this and there's like, you know, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. Um, there's another one where if I just put in FT8, um, automatic logging to logbook. And this is an example where if you click on that one, it'll bring you to the instructions, but the instructions are a video. So you don't have to go hunting for it on our, on our YouTube channel, it just takes you directly there. Um, if you want information on the satellite, um, it'll, you know, here's satellite tracking or correct frequencies or introduction to satellites. Um, you can go to the next section where you get more information and screenshots and so on. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's how that works out. Um, I do awards tracking, for example, you know, It'll take me to awards tracking. Now, if, if you didn't find what you're looking for from right here, you can um, you can log in. That's what the button I've got up here. You can log in and create um, a support ticket um, and somebody will get back to you and, and help you with it. Um, you can also send an email or you can um, call us. Um, Usually we're on the phone with customers. So if you call us, please leave a voicemail message. And when you do, it'll go straight into the ticket queue and you won't lose your place in line. That's how that works. A quick question. Um, I've never done before, but in satellite tracking, what kind of what kind of protocol do you use to what kind of equipment? Um, do you, are you talking to another computer? Or are you talking directly to this? The rotor box you, you or... have yeah you would have some sort of an interface between your computer and the rotor box so the rotor box the one that's got the either the up down levers on it or sometimes it's a knob um they don't have a pc interface in them so you have to get one and um there's a number of if you if you've got a yesu rotor um, there's an interface they sell called a GS232, and they're really proud of it because um, it's about a, I don't know, the last time I looked, it was five or $600 for that interface, which actually probably has about $20 worth of parts in it. Um, there are other really good um, choices for that. Um, Fox Delta makes something called the ST. To USB and I love that box. It's great if you're a satellite operator. Um, it, it does a great job. Hooks up to the Yesu um, G5500 nicely or a 5000. Um, there's a uh, Idiom Press makes a, a rotor card that plugs right into the uh, Yesu box. Most of my rotors are all Yesu, so that's what I'm using. But if you had an Alpha or a M squared or it all pretty much works the same way. You need some sort of an interface between the PC and the rotor controller box. Okay, and the, so the equipment, frankly, the equipment's not that expensive. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up our YouTube page here real quick and um I'll show you just as an example um the video that we did on this. I'm not gonna play any of it because we're Basically, we're, you know, a remote of a remote of a remote, but um, if we click on the videos here and come down, you know, here's me, of course, me and Lindy are um, obviously having a, yeah, a yeah. drink as we go along, but let me mute this. Maybe I can kind of give you a, a still shot of this as we go forward in this. So here is, hang on a second. This is... If you can, you can see the rotor right now. Yep. Okay. So this rotor, as it as it stands, is um, this is a Yesu G fifty five hundred rotor, and um, 
So the, the top part is the elevation part and the bottom part is the azimuth part. It's actually sitting on top of a, um, a, a heavy duty musical speaker stand. So you don't even have to have this stuff out full time. And I don't. Um, the antennas in this particular case are elk antennas. They're, um, there's a, uh, they're both um, capable of uh, two meters and 440. So one of them I'm using for receive and one of them I'm using for transmit. And then, um, so and I had, this happens to be when we were in Australia. So then here's me inside the, the shack and um, I don't know if I got a good picture of the, uh, you can actually, if I played this, you can actually hear me working stations. Um, I, I'm using a Yesu FT991. Here's um, this image shows the Fox Delta controller. So that's what's sitting here. The G5500 controller box is sitting here. So this is connected to this Fox Delta interface and then to my PC. And then you can see the FT991 here. Um, in this video, I'm working um, through the International Space Station um, on that particular occasion, but it's cool stuff. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun, particularly when, you know, for whatever reason, the solar cycle is bad or, um, you know, the, um, the solar flare knocks out HF activity. It's, it's really good for finding something else to entertain myself with. But I, I think like those, those antennas, I probably have, you know, a couple hundred dollars in those antennas. The rotor uh, probably cost, I don't know, $500. Um, you might be able to find them in the flea market. Um, although they're very popular, it's hard to find them. So I, I bought a new one. That Fox Delta interface is a hundred bucks versus the Yesu one that's like five or six. Um, and then you know what a 991 costs or whatever you want to use for your uh, your rig. So if you get the uh, adapter that runs USB, that can run straight off the same computer that's running your software. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've actually done this on a laptop. Um, the the image I was showing you there a while ago is my proper you know large station but um, the pc with it but uh it's one pc i've actually taken it out you could do this at a poda activation frankly you could go out with the same setup that i had right there um and you know you could you could connect it up to your laptop as long as you can power the um rotor uh the rotor controller box which is going to be it's going to need 110 but if you got some way to run that, you'd be able to do everything else. So can you track uh, or estimate tracking for even bodies in space like Jupiter or moon, the moon? Uh, you can do the moon and the sun in the application. We've, we've not found a reason to track Jupiter yet, but it's certainly something we could do. Okay. I'm just curious. I've heard people talk about Jupiter as a an RF emission source. Interesting. Well, you know, there there might be creatures up there that you know we could we could work. That would be some pretty significant DX. That would be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, planets worked. Planets worked the world. Mm -hmm. So the um, one more thing on the features. Um, so you get the releases for free, you know, with once you buy the software, it's a license. But along the way, then that's why you, that's why you have renewals is because if you renew it, then that gives you on top of the releases, gives you the features. Yeah. And so the thing that here's the important thing, though, is that if I don't if I don't come out with features that you find interesting, then you don't part with your money. Right. So there's nothing there's nothing for you to do. You know, you just keep downloading the software and make no mistake about it. Lindy is definitely going to send you renewal offers because that's what I pay her to do. But you can say, well, okay, 
no, no thanks this time. You know, I'm going to wait for the next feature to come out and I'll reconsider it. Or we've got, we've had a lot of people recently who have been using our software since 2014. Somebody told them about HRD alert or they bought a new computer and uh, they just are a new uh, computer or a new radio and they wanted some help getting it all going. And, you know, they basically said, Hey, can you, can you help us get this going? And they renewed their maintenance for that. Um, so, you know, either way it's um, that's, that's why we do it like that because it's completely optional. Um, have you got a bullet list of each of the cost items? I have a... Not necessarily with cost, just where we can see what the different options are. Yeah, let me let me bring up... Uh, hang on a second. Um, I, I stopped sharing, apparently. So I'm going to... I'm going back to sharing. But I'm going to show you um, the website here because... That's where you'll see what you're asking about. Hang on one second. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay. You should be able to see something that looks like our website here. And mm -hmm. um, this is hamradiodeluxe.com. And uh, the choices are kind of right here. If you want to, if you're a new customer, you buy now. If you're a renewal customer, you can renew. If you want to do the 30 day trial, it's over here. But if you hit renew, it'll take you to a page where you can you can buy that and you can see that it's $49.95 regularly. Um when you get um when Lindy's running promotions, usually it's something like 20 or 30 percent off. So that'll be, you know, it won't be 50 bucks, it'll be 30 or 40 bucks. Um, there's another deal that would basically get you a renewal. We've got something called an auto renewal. Let me load this up. So we've got something called an auto renewal, which if you want to renew every year, and about 20% of our customers do renew every year, but this is a 40% off membership, if you want. Um, it's uh, $29.97 and people sign up for that. So that's basically a 40% discount like that. But um, if you just came to the website and clicked on buy now, you'll see the options there. Um, you know, new customers, it's normally $99.95. Uh, renewal customers, it's $49.95. You can buy it for a friend. So if you buy it as a gift for a friend, then it's, um, and we discount this too, but normally it's $99.95 and, um, when you buy that, you get a, a key for your friend that you give to them and that they, they would activate it. Some people have really large, complicated logbooks. So we've got a conversion um, service that we offer, but most people don't, you do it. I'm the one that ends up doing that service. And basically I do probably two of them a year. Um, we also resell Ultima's virtual serial port driver too. So basically, if you went to our homepage, there's a couple of ways to get to what I just did. But if you if you just go to the buy now, you're going to see this. And if you went, if you're not a customer, you put in view. Let's say you add this to cart. And for the purposes of this, oh, I I need to. Uh, it's got the quantity there. I'm going to go to checkout. For the purposes of this presentation. You guys get a discount if you put in club 35 and hit apply coupon that takes the price down from a hundred bucks to 65 bucks. I'm going to show you that on the screen here in a moment, but um, um, that's, that's a discount that uh, we're offering for the club. If you have club members that didn't make it tonight, you can tell them, Hey, we saw this presentation on Hamrio deluxe. It's great. There's a discount offer for this. And, um, it's club 35 at checkout. Let me bring up the presentation and I'll actually show you. Um, I don't get there again. Hang on a second. I'm gonna hit the stop share and I'm gonna come back over here and put that up so you guys have that.
I keep thinking I'm just going to get one standalone screen that I can um, that I can flip all this stuff over to when I'm trying to share. Hang on one second. That's uh, not exactly what I wanted to show. Hang on. Hmm, maybe it is. I'll just do it this way. Can you see the screen now? Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. We get ah. I'm tempted to share the whole entire screen, but I won't come over too well. Mm -hmm. Share this done. Okay. All right. So this should, um, this will show you um, the coupon code. If you want to write it down, share it in your newsletter. It's good through Sunday night. So basically that gives us about 72 hours or so that that coupon code's active. It's good for renewals and new customers. So that puts the cost of a um, of a new customer on this at um, sixty five dollars, and then uh, renewal is half of that, or thirty two fifty, I think, if my math is correct. Any other questions? Um, the FTA, do you require WSJTX? Yeah. Yeah, and the reason for that is, is that the, the way that Dr. Taylor and his developers have licensed FT8 as a protocol and the other protocols within WSJTX is that for anybody who includes those modes in their software, <clears throat> they have to publish their source code and um, obviously I can't do that. So we've taken the approach of, of integrating with WSJTX. And as you saw earlier in the presentation, it's, it's really, really good. It's integrated in pretty much the same way that DM780 is integrated. And then if, if they do new versions of FT8 or, you know, now it's FT4, if there's FT2 or FT whatever, um, no one has to wait for an update in Ham Radio Deluxe to use it. They just get the latest version of um, of uh, WSJTX and off they go. I'm gonna take the screen down so I can see you guys a little bit better. Hey boys, look away. So there the camera's in that thing, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we're all be staring off this yeah. way and the shoes on thank, our heads thank you mike that was a good presentation yeah, appreciate sure. it well good um yeah i hope to see you guys on the air um it's uh it's really enjoyable spending time with you guys and so if there's anything you need or anything i can do for you don't hesitate to ask we can send you follow-up questions yeah absolutely follow yeah absolutely um Mike at hrdsoftwarellc.com. You can find that on my um, on my QRZ page as well. Um, it's it's down in the comments. Um, if you want to ask me about HRD, down in the comments. Don't use the one that's underneath the call. I don't check that one very often. What's your PhD in? Technology oh. management. Technology management. I. Uh, I have an, my undergrad is in electrical engineering from Purdue. And oh, then I uh, have a master's degree in information science at Ball State. And Ball State offered to let me teach there as an adjunct. And I briefly considered um, going into teaching full time. And they said, well, you're going to need a, a, a terminal degree. You're going to need a, a doctorate in order to teach full time. And that's when I started it. And then later, you know, I found out that 
I could make a whole lot more money in retirement by being a consultant than being a teacher. So, you know, that's, that's what I, I will eventually do. Sounds good. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Um, boiler maker. What's that? Another boiler maker. Do we have one in the crowd? Yep. I went, to Purdue, I went to Purdue Calumet. Okay. okay. Yep. I've driven past that campus a lot. Yep. For some reason, you won't stop. <laughs> yeah. We we lived in well, there's that. We we yeah. lived in uh we lived in Valparaiso for a little bit when I was working in Chicago. Yeah, some of the guys I knew in high school went to Valpo Tech. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I grew up uh, about six blocks from Purdue Calumet. Okay. Yeah, a buddy, buddy of mine that I went to Purdue with is from Munster. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I had friends in Munster. Yeah. Yeah. It just gets, I, I, we, we moved to Texas and, you know, we're done with snow. All done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I left because I was done. I finished school, and but most of all, the windshield factor was just getting way too low. It we were getting like sixty below windshield factor, <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's just too much. I mean, you literally had frost on a three layer mask. Yeah, there's a, there's a stretch of like uh, on US thirty between Valparaiso and Chicago, uh -huh. in, in Northwest Indiana down through Hammond, Indiana, that. When the lake effect snow comes down out of um, Lake Michigan, yeah. the, the roads could be completely clear except for a five foot swath of so you know five foot deep and probably I don't know a mile wide that you have to somehow get through this thing. It's weird that it snows when the sun's shining. It's really weird. Yeah, I, I grew up in Hammond, so uh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Everybody's still talking the what 1967 snow, where it was like four foot snow with a 16 foot wind drifts. Yeah, I was in uh, east of Indianapolis in Greenfield in the blizzard of 80, or sorry, blizzard of 78, and um, we had snow up to the eaves of the house. Yeah, we experienced that in the 60s. Yeah, but I'm all done. I'm all done with it now. No more. <laughs> <laughs> now you got the texas heat well that that's true so i stay i stay indoors during the day where it's air conditioning i go outside at night it's pretty comfortable well there's a lot of hoosiers that moved to texas uh as the steel industry was going down the oil industry was going up in texas so a lot yeah. of people left northwest indiana yeah and it's interesting because when when i first in the early 90s um the the oil and gas industry kind of hit a slump and houses houses were cheap in the Houston market and then they they brought it back and um you know it really is a you know the place to to be right now for oil and gas that's for sure oh can you send us the slides yep sure can i'll do that um i'll send it to uh who needs them john or um send me rob rob yeah. Okay, can do. Thanks. I'll send those this evening. And um, I'll also send, um, there's a an overview that we've got that I can send you guys if you want to go and, um, you know, send a link to your club or whatever when you send it out. Yeah, whatever you want. To, and I'll, uh, I'll let you know when the, when the YouTube, when the video hits the YouTube. Okay. I'm going to edit this one and I'm, I'm going to put it on our YouTube, but I'm going to edit out some of the pieces that, you know, dead, dead air, but um, I'll, I'll get that done. And probably over the course of the next couple of days, we'll put it on our uh, YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash ham radio deluxe. I'm going to edit that where I had my microphone on, on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Thanks right, again, Mike. and I, I I enjoyed it. Hope to see you guys again soon. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, guys. For those of yeah. you that are left, uh, ARC is going to be out in the park this uh, coming Sunday, two to dark, uh, or until we get tired of it, I guess. But uh, starting around two o'clock.
that's Brook Run Park, and it's right there in Dunwoody off of North Peachtree Road. We'll be in the about right midway. Right across the street from here. <laughs> yeah, right across the street from here. Okay. We'll be back in the uh, midway back in the park where the road, uh, there's a second uh, exit or entrance. And uh, I believe the intersection is Georgia Way and North DeKalb Road. Off of Peeler Road. And it's off of Peeler. You'll uh, look for the Treetop Quest zip line uh, outdoor activity, and we're on the hill up above that at a pavilion. So, um, well, you'll see our antennas out and come join us. It's just a chance this weekend to play radio, especially if you're new. It's a chance to come out, uh, play on somebody else's radio, check out the antennas, ask questions, and hopefully get rid of some of the mic fright too. So, um, Always a good opportunity, but do join us. And uh, that's uh, Brook Run Park, Sunday, two until we're tired and ready to go home. So usually late afternoon, six, seven o'clock. And uh, like I said, it's a chance for you to come out and, and have some fun. So no radios, you don't need to bring anything. We'll have water and snacks and maybe some soft drinks too. So um, should be a good time. Anything else? Anybody got any questions for anybody in the club or anything? Need any help with anything? I had one thought. Uh, since we're in the next year or so, going to have to move the repeater and everything or do something about it. Is there any chance that the, whoever's in charge of the repeater can give us a class in okay. one of the meetings of, you know, how we're set up, what kind of equipment we got, and what is it? What do you do to put a repeater together? Just an educational thing. Yeah, we could do something like that. I don't see Stephen on here anymore, but we've certainly got some people on the club that uh, could probably do a presentation like that. So, yeah, we'll. Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, yeah that's always a topic of interest. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. Is yeah. And for those of you that uh, uh, Lynn just mentioned that if you don't know that because of insurance requirements on the Bank of America Tower, uh, it's looking like we're going to have to come off there in the next 12 months. Uh, insurance is just. Uh, quite expensive now up there and that's what they're we haven't had to do that in the past but we have to now so it's going to cost several thousand dollars to have insurance so kind of makes it difficult for us to continue up there we're looking for other sites at the moment uh hopefully in downtown up high somewhere so we're not and hopefully we won't lose too much of what we got maybe just a a more um a person a, a a building or a company that's more willing to work with us uh I hate to say it, than Bank of America is at this point. So we've become a litigious world, and that's where we are. Everybody's got to have insurance, and it costs a lot. So we're working on it, uh, but we're we're good probably for the next 12 months until we find something. So stay tuned, and uh, we'll we'll keep keep you up to date on that as it as things happen. So yeah, lunch tomorrow, right? In 15 hours. Yeah. Lunch tomorrow. Uh, what's the name of the place? I'm drawing a blank. Los Bravos. Los yeah. Bravos in uh, what? Brookhaven, I guess. Brookhaven, yeah. The yeah, Brookhaven area. Johnson County. Uh, if you want uh, direct or addresses for that, check our website, www.atlantaradioclub.org, and uh, you'll find uh, links to all the different uh, information on the club, lunches. Uh, we may even have, we'll try to get. Uh, a link to the event for Sunday up there also, so that you can uh, easily find it. So any other questions, comments, suggestions? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, everybody, I'd like to thank you for coming again tonight. Bill couldn't be with us tonight, our president. He's not feeling well. So um, we hope he'll live through tomorrow and we can see him again on Sunday. So. Mm -hmm. Did you tell them what time on Sunday? Yeah, Sunday again, uh, 2 till uh, 7 o'clock, we'll just say. That's about the time we've usually wrapped up in the past. So. Okay. All right. Oh, we're giving some of the testing. I'm sorry. Oh, right. It is a busy weekend. And, of course, testing. Uh, we we, uh, we sponsor license testing, and we'll be at uh, Peachtree to Cab Airport there in Chambly. And uh, that's sponsored by the ARC through the Laurel exam program. It's a free test. Uh, we don't charge like the ARRL. So come out and take a chance whether you think you're ready or not. It doesn't cost you other than the, the gas to get there. And then you can come join us at uh, Burke Run afterwards. So, All right. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening, and uh, we'll sign off. And uh, this, uh, this video will be edited and uh, posted with slides, I guess. Uh,
here in the next uh Excellent. future yeah in the future in, in the near future so Bye. Sure. all right everybody have a good evening we're signing off from uh Dunwoody, georgia seven three seven three eight three, three seven all right seven three that would be chain <laughs> we're out to stop this thing <laughs>